Um, I'm actually not uh, very well versed or, or I have to say good in anything like remote viewing or or, or traveling or, or any of those techniques. Uh, I, I tend to be... <laughs> my mind is okay. It tends to dream of things and, and visions and ideas, but as far as saying that I have traveled somewhere or that there is um, uh, travel, I'm, I'm pretty poor. It, it, as far as... Um, as far as our ability to uh, travel faster than the speed of light, I, I we had a we had evidence of it tonight. I honestly didn't know the background of what Ray in Pennsylvania has been discussing, and yet he said in the call that in private conversations, the topics we discussed almost to a T appeared to be as if we had compared notes. Now that could be considered a coincidence, could be considered chance, could be considered the fact that they're broad subjects. I mean, it all can be rationalized, but we are living now in the age that the hundredth monkey already knows. So we're living in the age where what you're doing will affect what I'm doing, what I'm doing will affect what others are doing, what others are doing will affect what all that we're doing. And so in that environment, the concept of hyperspace, fast and light travel, communication and viewing, it opens up all of that ability of, uh, of movement. And I believe, and this is the really exciting part, we haven't even discussed the communication of our knowledge with other planets. I think let's sort out our own, prob our own issues, but I think that is also having an impact. I truly believe that starlight is and, and, and awareness even more than starlight um, is is coming to us and we're coming to it as we start to clean up our knowledge and our uh, understanding of, of how powerful our mind is. Wow, yeah, that's, uh, that makes sense. Are we going to the back to the concept of the star chamber that we discussed what several months ago? Oh, the idea of the um, bit more information on that. Mm -hmm. The uh, on the what you said, the star chamber. Mm -hmm. what, what right, the unique collective awareness actually of or the collective awareness coming as a star chamber itself. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, the the way to view, and this is a this is a model that we. Um, we would find strange, but if you want to describe, see, our sun does not exist on its own. Our sun is part of an interstellar medium, an interstellar network of part of a stellar arm of the Milky Way. So it exists in an environment with, well, there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of stars within the, the structure of the Milky Way. So if you want to visualize how our sun looks relative to other stars in the Milky Way, and this is going to blow people's minds, but, but this is a visualization. Think of our solar system as a very large biological cell. connected to tissue, opaque tissue or transparent tissue, where it is made up of hundreds of billions of cells, and that the Milky Way is a, well, it's like a starfish, isn't it? It looks like a starfish. Uh, it is a giant living organism of cells, and those cells are stars, and that the interstellar medium holds those stars in place and that's another mind-blowing concept because when you look at the the sky our astronomers have never told us that the stars relative to one another are fixed within the interstellar medium yes there is a shift but the shift is the relative perspective from the earth rotating and our wobble it does not mean that the stars themselves 
are moving relative to one another. And this is some of the wisdom that I believe will help us uh, see that something as large as a sun mirrors the knowledge of nature of an organism as small as you, as small as the cells in your thumb. Mm, wow. All right. We, I uh, didn't mean to skip this question. I guess 21 asked this question, and I, I think this will um, fit right in with what we're talking about. Can you please explain your proof in your conclusion of the sun literally having a conscience? and uh, where the sources are for, for that information. Okay, very simple. Uh, let's talk about existence. Existence is predicated on two things, if we deal it with the most simplest of models. Matter, whether I call it a cell, a sun, a planet, a meteor, elenin, whatever it is, matter cannot exist in reality without rules. What do we mean by that? Well, rules being the order, whether it be gravity, strong force, weak force, electromagnetic force, um, the interaction of, of elements is fundamental to the stability of the universe. If there were no rules, then matter could not aggregate into higher form. There would not be the universe we see. So clearly, when we look out through our senses, there is some order, there is some obeyance of matter to form. So no one can say that the universe is devoid of rules. Rules are a fundamental component to existence. So if matter depends on rules, and certainly rules in themselves, whether we say dimension, people think, well, science says that dimension can exist without objects, but I argue that's an absurdity, that in, in all cases, rules themselves are meaningless without, in reality, without objects. And that's a very big issue with science, is saying that rules and objects are, uh, are interlinked. So if matter can't exist without rules and rules can't exist without matter, then how did the universe come into being? And the, and the short answer is that matter simply can't exist in reality. And if you want to get this concept in your mind, draw a big circle. Put the word reality in the circle and put the word unreality outside the circle. And then underneath the word reality, put the words rules and matter. Just so you can get it in your mind. Matter can't exist without rules in that circle, in that reality. And rules can't exist without matter. And matter can't exist outside of that circle. So an object is an object because it's measured. If I can't measure it, it doesn't exist. That's, that's, you know, bottom line. The only thing that can exist outside of that circle is the concept of rules in theory. And the only example of something being ethereal and real, the only example of dimension, space being created and uncreated, is a dream. Hence, Unique collective awareness, the observer of the dream, Eucadia. Now, if this is true, and it is, and it can be proven to be the only logical answer to existence, that the universe indeed is a dream, then I have no need to go into the detail of talking why the sun is conscious. Okay? Okay, very, very good. Thank you, Frank. Um, Next question by uh, guest 32. Uh, the dead shall rise first, and those that are alive shall be caught up with them in the air. Uh, what is the meaning of that passage? Okay, I want, to make a se I want to make a separation with rapture, which was a yeah. recruitment concept that was brought in in the 19th century. Um, 1859, thereabout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And look, it's you know the, the, it's one of these ideas that sounds great in theory, but really, in fact, um, totally contradicts and goes against the essence of scripture. We are told certain things. We are told certain things in scripture, and it's called revelation, or 
and it is it's called revelation and the the point is that that those prophecies when the the time comes to be revealed the meaning will be revealed and it will give us something deeper what rapture did as an idea is it if you like started to corrupt prophecy it tried to find a kind of a way around it isaiah and a number of prophets daniel throughout the new testament and definitely obviously in the book of revelation make it categoric and unequivocal an end times prophecy will be revealed and specifically the dead shall rise it did not say anything about the living it was specific about the dead now I want to go back to that if the ruling elite had not created the Sester KVs and in creating a Sester KV for every man woman and child on the planet for hundreds of years and certainly in place since the 30s then the revelation that the dead shall rise to me would not make as much sense as it does today because by saying the dead shall rise on the day of judgment we're literally describing the end of a system of ultimate perversity I mean can you imagine when people finally realize that they've been living in a system that interprets as if they're dead that the system actually not interprets it actually needs as part of its function to believe the absurdity that living beings are considered dead I mean that's 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 I can't think of anything more deluded than that that is the ultimate of deluded thinking you cannot get crazier than that so the revelation that this December the 21st and that we have given on the day of illumination the Vatican the opportunity to do the right thing themselves to me is a revelation of unquestionable historic significance the end and collapse of the sister KVs now when you add to that you add to that the significance of the covenant of one heaven of the end of hell and that hell being a state worse than death it is the the dead dead then the dead shall rise even to those that have passed from this dimension to the next and the unity and the forgiveness is itself even greater so I believe that in the words the dead shall rise we see a validation that comes through history to this present day to speak to us and say look whatever chatter whatever doubt whatever uncertainty people throw your way look at this pillar of belief and know the truth of what you hear and see the dead shall rise because this is the end and the beginning so sorry I, I know I'm pretty emphatic there Terry but I think it's a fundamental issue a fundamental issue yes uh, thank you Frank and uh, we'll go to Greg here on the phone and see what she has to add with that Hi, hello Greg hi I, I'm going to change the subject where maybe it's partly this way I Frank, I have a question regarding um, the RH rhesus monkey factor, RH negative and RH positive. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes, I can. The reason I brought this up is that uh, my friend Linda is RH negative, her daughter's RH negative, her son's RH negative, and when her daughter was um, pregnant with her son, and I think the father was O positive, and, and of course she being O negative, she had to take a shot, I guess, in order to not eject or reject the child so he wouldn't die um, could you explain do you have any knowledge on this or could you fill in the blanks on this because we're not clear on this rhesus monkey issue as far as the genetics sure. well well one of the I mean um, I'm I'm always cautious sure Greg and I'll, I'll try not to uh, to make it a long a long-winded answer but I'll, so I'll try and I'll bring it bring it down as short as I can genetics even today 
is a, as you know, an extremely 